Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chloe Adcock, and I am the coordinator for this year's International Development Roundtable Series. The Development Roundtable is a high-profile speaker series where leaders and scholars within the international development sphere address our students, faculty, and the wider community um, on trends and challenges that are shaping the field. On behalf of everyone in the IDEV community, as well as the Conflict Management Department, I would like to welcome you all today to our roundtable with our esteemed guest, uh, Nancy Lindberg. Nancy Lindberg is the President and CEO of the United States Institute of Peace, an independent, nonpartisan, and federally funded institute to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflicts. Ms. Lindbergh has spent most of her career working on issues of transition, democracy and civil society, conflict and humanitarian response. Previously, she served as the Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict and Humanitarian Assistance at USAID and responded to crises in Syria, droughts in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, the Arab Spring and the Ebola crisis. Prior to that, she was President of Mercy Corps. Today, she will be talking with Professor Paul Miller about the root causes of extremism and how to adopt a new preventative approach. She will also discuss how the development community can play a role in this effort and cooperation and coordination strategies for both the US government and the international community. This topic is of particular salience, salience here at SAIS, where many of us study extremism and conflict prevention from the lens of our respective disciplines, and today we will be bringing these together. Paul Miller is an adjunct faculty member here at SAIS who teaches courses on humanitarianism and aid. He is a senior policy advisor at Lutheran World Relief and specializes in food security, aid reform, and development effectiveness. So without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Professor Miller so we can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe, and, uh, and thank you to the SAIS International Development Department um, and the other departments that are sponsoring this, and, and I think it comes I guess maybe the past couple of years, we would say this is a, this is a timely moment. But I think, in particular, Nancy, this is this is a moment in which um, both USIP's work and your experience can really shine an important light um, on the subject. So, and I'm very pleased to be here and and uh, and flattered I can be part of part of this. And, and really looking forward to the questions that are are coming from our our audience, or rather our audiences, since we also have one in Bologna, in Italy. So we're looking forward to that part of the program as well. Um, um, but Nancy, I've, I've followed and, and or certainly followed from afar and sometimes more closely your career. You have an amazing career and you've been in amazing places at interesting times. Um, you're currently at the U.S. Institute for Peace. Can you give a brief overview of the USIP's mission um, and what the organization does? Sure. And um, Paul, it's great to see you again. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with everybody. Thank you, Chloe, who's worked to keep us organized up here. Um, so U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, as Chloe said, is a very interesting institution in the Washington landscape because it is nonpartisan by statute. It is a, a federal institute, but it is independent, so it's not part of the executive branch. Uh, but we interact very closely with state, AID, Department of Defense, NGOs, international organizations, and we bring together on our staff and with our platform, people, you know, diplomats, security experts, development experts, academics, scholars, practitioners. So I think of it as sort of the ultimate Switzerland platform. Mm -hmm. And it is by design, it enables people to think outside the, the expertise and bureaucratic stovepipes that as this profession has become increasingly um, expert over the last several decades, uh, to get outside those constraints and think more holistically about a really complicated problem set that we all need to work on with, with more effective shared frameworks. And at a time where uh, my career has seen the extraordinary increase of crises and emphasis on response to those crises, uh, for me, the opportunity to really focus on getting into the prevention space of how do we understand conflict and how do we understand how to prevent that, those conflicts, which is the core mission of USIP, um, is, is a, it's a very timely moment. Um, since I left AID when the combined humanitarian budget of the United States, if you take yeah. PRM and the, what my bureau administered, 
when I left in 2015, that combined budget was about $3 billion. So five years later, it's closer to nine. Nine or eight, yeah. Eight or nine. Eight or nine. Yeah. That's an incredible increase. You know, couple that with the military increases. We are so reactive in how we think about these crises that have just escalated. Yeah. So, so a non, let, let's hold that thought. A nonpartisan convener across stovepipes and, and disciplines and trying to distill this experience. So I have to ask this question. Does everyone know the US, U.S. Institute for Peace? It's a beautiful white building. I sometimes joke I have to wear the sunglasses inside. Because sometimes you do. We put, we've put shades on. <laughs> no, so, but I, I do. I, there was who, a, who knows what USIP is? We know where it is. It, it, it's... Yeah. Who, State who's been there for a program yeah. or inside the building? Yeah. Quick, oh, quick man, survey. you guys, we got to fix that. Okay, yeah. It's an amazing space, <laughs> and amazing things happen there. I, what, I always thought there was like, a moment. What goes on there? Well, well, I said what I've been, but one of the things I've noticed is that, that when the building was new, there was, as, even though it's been supported across the aisle in a bar, bipartisan way, there was a moment there when uh, different parts of, of Congress was taking pot shots at the administration and different structures. And there was a while when it seemed like your beautiful white building was attracting negative, negative heat. Yet at the same time, it seems now that everyone seems to accept your role and you seem to be, on the contrary, not only in accepted but integrated um, and, and, ex and understood as an important voice on these issues. How did that happen? Well, we've put a lot of effort into uh, telling members of Congress more, th more frequently, more thoroughly what it is we do and what the impacts are. And, um, you know, and I think coupled with the moment that we're in, but what USIP does is it, it, it brings together research with policy recommendations, with support for frontline actors on the ground. So we have teams and partners and most of the hotspots around the, the, the big strategic important hotspots. Um, and uh, that's, in, that's valued on both sides of the aisle. And interestingly, we are uh, very good at, uh, at the request of Congress, often convening uh, non or bipartisan task force mm -hmm. or study groups or commissions mm -hmm. to r look at some of the naughtiest problems. So a very famous yeah. uh, example was the Iraq study group right. in 2005. Right. Right. Um, and a second example is what I think we'll talk about later today, which is this preventing extremism in fragile states. This, but especially when we're in, a, in an increasingly heightened and partisan environment, uh, it's an opportunity to bring people together from all sides of the political aisle to find where are those points of agreement. Because regardless of what's happening domestically, there are some really big challenges around the world that we need to bring our best thinking to bear on how to solve it. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, you mentioned it, and I think we'll go there right now. I'm preventing extremism in fragile states. Should I? Yes, I brought a prop. Should we just show it, show it <laughs> around? Um, well, on the website. And I did reread it, and so thank you, thank you, Chloe, for, for kind of centering this conversation around it, because I did reread it, and, and it was remarkable in, I thought, its honesty and its frankness, as well as, again, trying to come up with not only the research, but also some recommendations as well. Um, one, of, one of the arguments um, in, in, uh, in the publication is that we have to fight the root causes um, of extremism and terrorism. So for people who haven't read the report, can you just give a couple of, of pointers from the report and from, from your experience? What are these root causes? Um, yes, but let me preface that by saying that the co-chairs of this 15-person uh, task force, which included very eminent members of, you know, people like uh, Madeleine Albright, um, Steve Hadley, Kelly Ayotte, uh, you know, so people from both sides of the aisle who had experienced uh, high levels of government or other related fields. Um, it uh, was co-chaired by Governor Kane and Congressman Lee Hamilton, who you may recognize were the co-chairs of the 9-11 Commission report that was pulled together after 9-11. And what they were passionate about and why they took on the task of chairing this is they said, look, we had three main recommendations coming out of the 9-11 report, and two of them were implemented, and the homeland has been kept safe. But the third one was not implemented, which was to adopt a strategy of prevention. And in the intervening 18 years, we have spent somewhere in the neighborhood of $7 trillion fighting the war on terror. 
And in that intervening period, the number of extremists have substantially increased around the world. Um, so clearly, we need to rethink our strategies. I mean, it's sort of unequivocally not working. And so what the task force did was really look hard at a lot of research and experiences that we have over the last decade and a half uh, to understand this issue more. And the, the very top line recommendations are you know, all about how do you fundamentally move towards a policy of prevention. And they're number one, you need a shared framework across the US government so that we are using our extensive capabilities we have great capabilities, but they work off of very different theories of change and understandings of what is it that we're trying to accomplish and how might you get to the goal mm -hmm. of preventing violent extremism in fragile states. Secondly, that we have what they call a, a, a prevention initiative that enables Congress to unleash these capabilities from the kind of bureaucratic constraints and earmarks and all the ways that we handcuff our diplomats and our security and our development experts. Um, and thirdly is to really accelerate the partnerships. You know, that we obviously can't do this alone, that there are a lot of other critical actors and important actors out there that we can and should partner with more effectively. So that's the nutshell of, you know, it sounds really common sense, but sometimes common sense is what hasn't been followed. Mm -hmm. And it's very helpful to have a group of experts kind of stand back and, and, um, and track. So, so, so this is the unfinished homework from the 9-11 Commission is what you're saying. And that, in some ways, one of the most important elements that wasn't responded. I'll, just to summarize from what I heard, USIP's approach is also to convene this kind of leadership, not just the experts, but also people who will be useful in the dissemination of the results. In other words, people who are picked from areas Right? Who, can, who can go back and also be, be part of the way in which you're disseminating and, and trying to influence um, the take up or the uptake of these, of these recommendations? Well, I think it's a combination of credibility, experience, and legitimacy. Yeah. You know, that yeah. this, th these are people who are respected in a diverse set of arenas whose, whose uh, deliberations on this really carry weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that's very heartening um, and it um, dovetails with the work that ha w a lot of organizations have been working on for a long time. So we, we didn't do new research. We pulled right. on extraordinary research and experience. But most of these recommendations have been enshrined in legislation that's now moving its way through Congress. Mm -hmm. So it is resulting uh, in fairly immediate potential for action. Uh, it's passed the House. It has not yet, it's called the Global Fragility Act. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a remarkable piece of legislation because it really follows in, you know, with some very specific details, but those, those three key recommendations. In the Senate, it has bipartisan sponsors, I think about 24, and it's hopefully going to pass one way or another in the next, in this, in this session, in this Congress. Yeah. So Global Fragility Bill, Act. Act, not yeah. unrelated to peace, in other words. You're saying prevention is required um, to address the root causes of extremism. You have three recommendations that if implemented, and this legislation, Global Fragility Act, will help do that, you know, we can begin to make some progress. Um, but I've often heard different explanations of why there is extremism in the world, uh, depending on who you ask, um, what academic discipline, um, or the man or the woman on the street. Um, and I know, I know when, when Chloe and I were talking about the questions that, that other factors that, that may seem not to be directly relevant also have entered the discussion. Um, can you just sum up some of those root causes? So we talked yep. about climate change and, and the youth bulge as being other perhaps exacerbating. Or, uh, is there one or two factors or is it a suite of factors that you, you honed in on? Well, I, I mean, I, you have to start with I think the, sh the, the clear understanding that every complicated or every fragile state is, is going to be highly complicated and you need to Different, look at yeah. what, has, what exactly is going on in that context. But um, you can start from the shared premise of what is fragility. Um, so fragility is, is, a, is a break 
is a breakdown of the social contract between a government and its people. And it's usually characterized by highly fragmented or marginalized populations, non-inclusive institutions, distrust of government. Um, and there are many indices that measure this across domains like social, economic, security, kinds of factors. Um, and there's pretty clear convergence across these indices of who's at the most fragile end of the spectrum. Um, and it is a spectrum, and, and, and countries do move up and down. And it's, it's imprecise, but I think there's, there's a, lot of, yeah. a, a lot of data that backstop the, the understandings around that. And the, the premise of the task force was that it's those conditions of fragile states that enable extremist ideology to take hold, to take root, and to spread. And so if all we do is continue to whack away at extremists after they've emerged, after they're spreading and, and or holding territory, that that's a whack-a-mole exercise that we'll never get ahead of. Um, but that you really need to look at the kind of grievances, unmet grievances, the non-inclusive institutions. And by the way, probably for this group, that doesn't sound that radical. Because these are core, you know, so the solution set is how do you create more inclusive institutions? How do you listen to citizens? How do you address, address understand and address unmet grievances? These are kind of core principles of development, right? So this will sound very familiar to this audience. This is not true if you come from more of a diplomatic or security environment where different imperatives related to national security may take precedence over the longer term, often generational exercise of understanding, meeting, and addressing citizen grievances, building more inclusive institutions, access to justice, security sector reform. So that, that goes to the number one yep. recommendation is we need a shared understanding across our government capabilities about what's the nature of the problem. I'm also hearing a shared re-priority set or pri priority setting in a different way in terms of our national interests. It's not that there aren't other national interests that we would just, you know, reject in order to do the prevention. It's that sometimes those national interests, you know, don't seem to take into account this medium to longer term prevention work. Is that kind yes, of what Yes, and, and I'm sure anybody who's looked at this has has participated in that that differing time scale concern right. that you know development operates over a long term horizon, whereas often security and development actors have shorter term horizons and imperatives, and so this is trying to get that synced up. Um, what this, what it doesn't do, and so two other points. Mm -hmm. One is this is happening at a time of enormous convergence. This conversation of fragility and what yeah. to do about yeah. it. I mean, the World Bank has a new strategy coming out. There's something called the Cameron Commission that came out of the UK. The UK government has a new strategy that they, I think they call it stabilization strategy, but it's very similar concepts. Um, uh, the UN is embracing this agenda. The next development roundtable is features, I think, someone from the World Bank. This is the gentleman who runs the Fragility and Conflict. Fra yes. Oh, right. Yeah. So he will, he will also be here. So there's Next enormous, round. enormous convergence. And you know, I think it's, it's its own interesting case study of how it takes a decade for new frameworks and ideas to take hold and really spread to major institutions. Because a number of us have worked on these ideas for a long time. But, which is my long introduction to saying, the UK in their stabilization strategy has one really important piece that we did not include and uh -huh. is not in the legislation. And that is they require in their national security de deliberations to um, call out when and why a short-term security imperative will take precedence over a longer term. Wow. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, it, it acknowledges different. that there are going to be times yes. where you just have to take the short-term security action. I mean, we would be you know, extremely Pollyannish if we didn't acknowledge that. But they're saying you have to be mindful about it and you have to say it and document it. That, those, that play of interests, we don't <laughs> often see it um, as visibly, I think, here. Or sometimes it seems couched in different ways. But I wanted to follow up. First of all, I love, there's a great chart. <laughs> there's your, so many. Which there, one? Well, one of the great <laughs> charts, sorry. One of the great charts is, is, is one which is my next question, which is, you know, I, I talk, you know, what is our Hippocratic Oath 
you know, that, that, that we need to, for international actors. Let, let's not make it worse. But I noticed that one of the charts talks specifically about the issues of injustice and exclusion and ways in which international actors, by favoring a short-term security interest over a long-term support for democracy or civic space, can make things worse, as well as yeah. the environment of a fragile state can invite some of these actors in. And some, so I love that chart simply because it was summing up. And as you say, there are many others. But you are bold in the report, and in, in a way that we, at least I haven't always seen in Washington. Maybe I I'm, I'm talking to the wrong people, um, but it seems you say specifically military interventions which create political vacuums, think fill in the blank, right? Iraq, Libya, name them, or security assistance which may have inadvertently contributed to syst systematic neglect and exclusion in places like Yemen and Mali in addition to diverted U.S. weapons. So that's a strong statement saying, you know, we've made it worse. Uh, we've met the enemy and it is us, in part. So in is, part. In part. In part, is there a broad consensus across U.S. military, diplomatic, and other foreign policy actors after Afghanistan and Iraq, you were just in Afghanistan, that this is the case, that we made it worse, that we need to stop this, let me, let me use my words, usually kinetic, focused, you know, shooter response? Um, and, you know, what would, be the, what would be that Hippocratic oath not to make things worse? One of them is obviously this making visible the short term versus the long term. What are the other things that we should make sure U.S. policy just doesn't make worse? So I think I can't speak to how broad the consensus is. That would be an interesting poll to do, actually. But we are hearing more and more particular support, both for USIP and our approach, but also for the report, mm -hmm. support for not leaning so heavily and exclusively on our military assets. I mean, that has become sort of the tool of choice that Congress reaches for and policymakers reach for, for a lot of obvious reasons. You know, you get an impression of fast, effective action when you throw your military assets on, 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 into the arena. And I think those who've been working the problem in the field are keenly aware that they cannot solve the longer term conditions-based problems. Um, so there is growing support to answer that. I, I would also note that it's not only a question of time horizon, um, this, this need for alignment, because USIP, Stanford, and Chatham House jointly did a study about five years ago that looked at a decade of action in Afghanistan. And you can, it's also on our website. Yeah. But it, it concluded with participation of diplomats, military development, you know, Afghans, Europeans, US, um, that we had actually been fighting three very different wars, or we had pursued three very different lines of effort for the first decade of our time. In Afghanistan, the military were fighting Taliban, the, ICE, the intelligence folks were, were hunting al-Qaeda, and the development people were busily over here trying to rebuild the state. And what happened in those other two lines of effort actually undercut the ability to make progress on the state building exercise, thus giving state building a really bad odor in a lot of policy circles. But when you're, you know, contributing to corruption in your search for information, you have to understand the impact that it will have over here. And that's not a, a, like a joined consciousness. I think it's uh, um, one of our military commanders who talks about shared consciousness mm -hmm. as a prerequisite for more effective action. Um, so yes, I think we have seen a growing agreement that that isn't the, the answer. And one of my favorite uh, reports that we drew from was a UNDP, UNDP report that cited um, a, a survey of 71, or a, a survey of, of current and former extremists, 71% of whom note heavy-handed action by security forces was the tipping point for them to be to join an extremist group. So a recruiting tool, in other words. It's a recruiting for, tool. Yeah. So when you have heavy-handed crackdowns, that's the best recruiting tool. And that's true for you know heavy-handed kinetic action. Right, exactly. Um, one of the, the interesting parts, and certainly this, this kind of also shades over into my day job in terms of the development work and in uh, an environment which, you know, I was one of those people in 1987. I was in the Sahel, bright-eyed bright and bushy-tailed, learning from the Senegalese, 
learning from all the great work that had been done before, um, the Sahel is a different place. Um, and, and it's an example of where there has been things that have been tried. There was something from the military side. There was the Trans-Sahelian Counterterrorism Partnership. Yeah. I just met a congressional staffer who says, oh, I did my PhD thesis on why that didn't work, or my master's thesis. <laughs> Great, well, you're in a perfect place now to, to address it. But I, one of, this issue of what works, you, the report says that modest preventative investments could reduce the allure of extremism. Um, yet the report notes that a study from 2016 across the USG that there is no shared view of why, how, and when to engage in fragile states. Um, Mercy Corps, you know, in, in leading in, in different ways, I know they, they did some, something that I, I really appreciated. They said, well, we were funded to reduce extremism. I think it was in Latin America. It, wasn't, it was a different kind of extremism. We were, we, were, we were hired to do this, but actually the model didn't work, this didn't work, and we were not addressing that anyway. Um, which I loved it because it was it was part of what I think our our group our, our our community needs to do more of, and they've obviously done some other great survey and good on the ground work. But that idea, there's a lack of consensus. How do we collectively work to learn what works and how to do it? Um, you're not saying wait and research more. You're saying do some stuff, modest preventative investment. Do we know enough about what works and what doesn't? Not just about not making it worse, but just there are other factors and um, other players who love this. I call it in my class, you know, the dark side of globalization. Yeah. There's, a, there's war economies um, where they're trafficking all kinds of things um, in all these places. And so there's a lot of things fighting against it, against these modest uh, investments. Do we know what works? And if so, what are they? Well, one of the things that we believe and the evidence suggests, you know, I would always caveat it, um, works is that you, you've got to pay more attention to country-led strategies. And country doesn't necessarily mean government, but you know the, the locally-led nature of some of these approaches. Because going to the trans uh, counterterrorism initiative, I mean, we so often use you know the 8,000-mile screwdriver where we come up with our great programs here in DC and show up in whatever country we're working. Um, it's difficult because it's, it's inherently corrupt, illegitimate, or just weak governance that is at the heart of the problem. And so if you, part, if you, if you need to partner with that government to make the change, they either won't or can't truly do it. So there has to be a variety of actors that you're able to work with um, whether it's local government or civil society, but some way to start getting at those core issues of weak and in non-inclusive institutions, you know, lack of access to justice sounds a lot like SDG 16 yes. for those who think about that, um, you know, and just addressing the grievances because that's what the and and, yeah. and a whole line of effort on security sector reform. And that's something the development world doesn't often pay enough attention to um, because we put a lot of money, the US government puts a lot of money into security sector reform. But often, it isn't really with an eye to citizen <coughs> security. And how cit without citizen security, you, you know, you, you, that's so fundamental to people being able to rebuild their lives, wanting to reinvest in their communities. Um, so. I think that there will continue to be a lot of lessons mm -hmm. and action research mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. the, the convergence that we have right now is based on uh, a last decade and a half of experience in research and learning a lot of what didn't work. Um, so we're at this very important ripe moment where we've reached the tipping point and all of that is now leading us to, okay, let's try that. Let's do things differently. But we will have to stay closely focused, A, to make sure that it doesn't just stay rhetorical, mm -hmm. because it's hard to yeah, change bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be really, like, yeah. you're going to hear the wheels screeching if this Global Fragility Act passes. Right, right. And we have to stay focused on ensuring that we're right, because we may not be. I mean, that, that issue, I mean, you, you said it well, and so you anticipated the question, so you already answered it in theory, which is great. But that, it still is a challenge. It's a challenge in development as well. The very, the very places that, that we want to do this work are fragile states, which by definition have weak or, or governments that, that are not taking care to address grievances. On the contrary, they may be causing them. Um, and so even if it's n civil societies involved, um, 
you know, those governments are not necessarily going to be buying in. Um, and, and, and I know you have the experience there, but, but the, on the other hand, there may be parts of a government can, but that's still a huge challenge. And the conflict prevention and the local and international actors involved, that can be perceived as very political, um, right? You know, we're, we're asking governments to address grievances um, as part of a, maybe conditioned on aid or, or whatever, and yet, and, and surely your, and your report shows that that's one of the things that some of the extremists do, is they start governing. They start right. meeting out rough justice, which at least it comes. With greater accountability, less corruption. Exactly. Or, and so or at least is, perceptually. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is... This and is, at least sometimes th for a short time. This is what my staff and Molly <laughs> and, and, and other places say. They've taken it over and they are giving justice. And, you know, it's, it's quick and, and, and you don't have to bribe for it. Um, and so that's, that's clearly the case. But at the same time, here we are, or those who would want to help some of the fragile states coming, donors or others saying, we want to help you, that's going to be seen as political. That may tip, that may affect the dynamics inside that we're trying to affect. So weak governments, um, how do you, how is a country led if the government is really not buying in or it's difficult to work with the government? Um, and how do we not, you know, our, our, our mere presence becomes an obstacle as well. Um, so I, don't, I just was wondering how, yeah. how, can, how can those things, because you're right, we have to work on it at the same time. Those are very difficult things to do. Yeah, but I, y y yes, you are absolutely right. Um, and I think that we can, there are so many ways in which we can do a better job. And, and you know, an example from when I was at USAID uh, and all the droughts were sweeping through the Horn of Africa, really crippling, led to famine in Somalia. But in Ethiopia and, and Kenya, um, there was uh, a really, I think, powerful moment where uh, State Department folks, led by Secretary Clinton, called the Kenyan government to say, we're going to put all this humanitarian assistance in for this drought, but you need to change your policies because your policies, your structural policies, are contributing to the mo more marginal communities falling into drought over and over again. So it, you know, it, I, that's just such a useful example mm -hmm. of how we don't combine that often enough to use the leverage that we have. And we're, from the development community, saying to the security and the diplomats, these core principles about country-led participation, governance, longer term, iterative change, you need to pay attention to that. But the development community needs to understand the, the fundamentally political nature of the work we're doing. You know, and I think that it is a fiction that we can be non-political. I mean, when I was at AID, there can was I a- Can get an amen? Yes, thank you. Thank there you was a that. big <laughs> debate when I was at USAID yeah. about bringing political economy yeah. Yeah. analysis yeah. Yeah. back yeah. into yeah. The, uh, the agency because as uh, somebody said to me once, there's nothing non-political about a Western aid agency teaching, you know, at, working on girls' education in southern Afghanistan. That's inherently political. So um, we've got to be more attuned to that. We have to understand how to, how to navigate that and embrace the complexity and knowledge that is required. Mm -hmm. um, so... Okay. I, I mean, it is, it is one that we're struggling with. On the other hand, I, I, I'm also, I'm personally, I think we have to engage, but making sure we, we watch what we do and, and don't make it worse, but also learn, as you say, they seem to be fundamental, and that's another reason why I appreciate the approach here. Um, one of the things that you've dealt with a lot, both from the NGO side as well as the AID side, and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, we're sometimes seen as prickly, whiny, um, at times, because we, we, we want to protect our equities and our, our and at least in the reputations and sometimes also the security. And putting development, uh, defense, um, um, and, and diplomacy together um, in, in, in certain times, in certain places, has created some, some challenges from the NGO community saying, wait a minute, um, are you undermining my neutrality? And we can debate, as we do in my class, whether NGOs are really neutral or, or are perceived as neutral or impartial or not, and that is a good debate to have. But at the same time, we've seen how anti-communism um, um, or uh, migration or these other interests can, can sometimes crowd out, um, you know, in terms of when you put all of these different actors together, some of those other big policy issues can crowd out 
some of these longer term and some of the things that, you know, and, and, and for some of the organizations who want to maintain their strict independence, um, they don't want to necessarily be seen as working with the foreign policy of the U.S. government at a particular time. Um, so, again, that, that's a lot. I mean, I was just wondering whether, you know, how do we avoid pitfalls in trying to get those different pieces to work together? One of the challenges, as you know, is, you know, the military is huge compared to the resources yeah. of the State Department um, or, or others. So what did we learn from Iraq and Afghanistan of, of, on the one hand, if we want development actors, we have to understand that they have their own way of working and we don't want to undermine that, yet we don't want them working on the side and not connected. Similarly, we want the military there, <laughs> and, and let me just say, the military, the students who've served in foreign or U.S. militaries in my class, they have such amazing things to contribute in terms of all the issues you're talking about, and this is another plug for, for why their voice is so important. But, you know, we've learned that there's some things we probably shouldn't do as we, as we try to bring these different parts, in this, in this case of the U.S. government, together. Um, what have we learned in order to you know, keep all the actors doing the things they do well, um, but don't undermine each other? Um, and in the case of the military, the, that the military doesn't overwhelm just by the number of people and the resources. Mm -hmm. So a couple of answers. The first is, um, you know, just a reminder, because this was probably, Paul, you and I were in a lot of these meetings back in the day, but um, the, U, the, the NGO uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent Code of Conduct right. does not use the word neutral. They use That's the word right. impartial. That's right. And there's a difference. That's right. Because the, the, the code of conduct is actually not neutral in terms of the outcome, but impartial in terms of who is served in service of that outcome. Right. Only the ICRC and MSF, Médecins right. Sans Frontières, have in their mandate, right. and only ICRC is truly mandated, uh, with the word neutral. And right. I think there's value in having those kinds of fundamentalist humanitarian organizations who are able to work across conflict lines and hot conflicts. You know, there's, there's absolute value in that. And somebody needs to be doing right. that right. important right. work. Right. But in a world of increasingly long duration, complex conflicts, to, to stay in that space, as opposed to the work that we see is so necessary in Assyria, Somalia, I mean, you know, name your conflict. Most of them go on for 15-ish years. And if all you're doing is that immediate life-saving stuff, I think you're doing a disservice to the communities because you can build a lot of capacity in a conflict. Um, and you should do. And that's already taking you into inherently political spaces. You have to understand who's benefiting, who are the winners and losers. I mean, you've got to have that clarity. I mean, there, there is in the Code of Conduct, I will, I will push back a little bit, it does say we will endeavor not to become instruments of foreign policy. Um, I'm, uh, right? But you don't need to be foreign policy associated to agree that you want to have participate in this shared goal of building greater resilience and lessening the fragility. Um, and then, Agreed. and then, my second point is um, actually is related to that. Is I, this is where language is so important? A lot of people say, you know, they talk about the the whole of government, or we need to integrate these capabilities. And I think that's the wrong choice of words because mm. I I don't think we're looking to integrate. We are looking to align within a shared framework okay. because these are actually very different capabilities different tool sets, different disciplines, different professional experiences that enable you to be mm -hmm. the top of your game in the military, the diplomatic sphere, the development sphere. And I have a much greater appreciation for that having served uh, both at AID and now at USIP. And by the way, I really, really advocate for people to st try different seats because it gives you an appreciation and a mutual respect mm -hmm. for what that yep. point of view brings to the table. But ultimately, they are different capabilities. So they shouldn't be integrated and smushed into all, you know, okay. like say you're all one. Great. But you need to have alignment so we don't have that Afghanistan experience where you're handing out bags of money to get information, but that's creating such incredible corruption that you can't do anything to, re to address the deficit of trust in the government. So, I, so it was Petra, It was actually General Petraeus yep. who said we yep. need a shared consciousness. Yep. Yep. We need that, that to have a oh, okay. shared yeah. framework of, uh, and, a, and a shared theory of change 
of why what we're doing will lead to what shared desired goal. And if we have a theory, you can try to operationalize it and measure the impact and learn whether it's working or not, in other words. Yeah, right. although measurement really gets tricky. Okay, okay, we won't go there. We will definitely not go there. I know, it's, a, it's I'll the avoid favorite that. NGO topic, I would, I, no, I good prefer, reason, I, but There's a reason tricky. why I avoid going there, because yeah. someone might try to measure my output or something. But one it's question. It's very important. I know. But you've got to do it carefully. But, yeah. Yes, yes, I will. Thank you, um, Chloe. Let, let's just, let's just, I just, my, I'm going to throw in one last question, and then some of the other ones will, will just hopefully the, the audience will bring them up. But about the role of humanitarian development aid. So this is kind of a coda to the last question. Um, you know, their current aid structure should that change? The funding, the authorities, the processes. Um, it's not fit to purpose. I mean, we say that even without the, in reference to extremism, it's, it's, it's a 1961 Foreign Assistance Act with all incrustations and amendments and all the things that you know so well. Um, but I'm just wondering, I mean, are, are there like either quick fixes or obvious things that we can do better? There's been some movement to improve aid, I would say, or at least an, an awareness on both the Republican and the Democratic side. Um, so any quick changes and then the role of you know, local, international, non-governmental actors, the private sector, universities, um, ensuring that aid and those agencies really do address those underlying causes of extremism. Well, it, that's a long topic, as you know. I, yeah. I, I would quickly say that uh, the Global Fragility Act, one of the important things that it does is provide longer-term, more flexible funding. Okay. And the problem we have right now is we have different pots of money. So we have pretty flexible, fast-acting, huge humanitarian funding. Um, but limits on what you can do with it. So in a long-term complex crisis, you are sometimes butting up against the envelope of what you can do yeah. when what you really need to be doing is helping those communities rebuild to the extent, you know, so that you have innate capability there even while they're undergoing conflict and maybe moving around. So one is, yes, Congress can do some things in terms of loosening that up. Uh, greater investment in local action. I mean, a lot of these things were all agreed upon at the Istanbul yep, yep, summit yep. in seven, 2016. 2015. 2015. I think okay. So. I think so. Then. I was there um, too. But we haven't really moved on that agenda because, frankly, it butts up against a lot of the business models and equities of many of the inner of the development actors. And you know, I'm a big fan of thinking differently about the categories. And uh, you know, as many, many people say, a community doesn't know if you're a relief agency or a development agency. We tried very hard with, when I was at USAID with the, this, what we called the resilience agenda, to erase those divisions so that you could move more seamlessly backwards and forwards to address whatever the needs were of the community. But you know, we still have these gaps where there's humanitarian action and then that dribbles out. And then there's this big gap while the development actors think about for a year what needs to happen, and then a whole new group of actors come in with development programs. It drives me crazy. You know, so it should be a more of a seamless whole. Yep, great. Thank you. No, this is, this is something. Wait, that's a great line for when we read the article, The NGO Scramble. But those, that, that, that sense that in, inside the, org, the, the, the community, that the way in which we raise money and the way we, we spend it you know, are, are also part of the problem. I think that's a, that's a huge point. I'd love, we've thrown a lot of tofu on the table um, for you to, to chew on. I'd love to have some questions from this audience as well as in Bologna. So please feel free, just uh, you can add an example or, or just a, a question of anything we've been talking about. And please identify yourself um, and your institution and make sure your question is in fact a question and try to keep it short. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Are there student questions before? Um, yes. Yes. So you need to call and oh, then oh, sure. Mic. Please. Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mayur. I'm a second year student concentrating on IDEV here. Thank you so much for your talk today. My question. I, I def, international development. 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 Sorry, international Which development. Got it. Okay. Um, my question is about the Kurds in <laughs> Syria. Um, I found the your insight about the alignment between the three Ds, defense, diplomacy, and development, very interesting. I'd love to hear your perspective on the situation of the Kurds in Syria from that angle of how to align what the defense is doing in terms of Whoa. what development and diplomacy should do in response. So that's kind of a whole different arena of questions. That's, a, a, um, you know, I would put that squarely in a national security conversation where we weren't trying to do that much on development. 
um, I think, uh, y you know, there's, there's a big scramble of people trying to understand that decision and a lot of concern, um, mainly from a credibility of U.S. Uh, situation and the resulting concerns over humanitarian issues. One thing that we've been working on at USIP is with an interagency workshop on how to address the 70,000 members of the El Hol camp of ISIS families, women, mainly women and children. And now that is all up in the air because it's unclear who will hold the territory um, around some of these camps. So it's a very difficult uh, new state of affairs that I think is causing a lot of, of uh, concern and chaos uh, to figure it out. I, I would put that in a different category of conversation, though. Great. Yeah. Other questions? Tommy. So I have a million questions, but I'm going to try to ask you only one. And who um, are you, Tommy? I, I'm the director of the International Thanks. Development Program, and I actually don't focus specifically on fragility and development, but on public service delivery. And public goods delivery is essentially the contract between a state and its people. That is what states do. Um, and in that sense, I just want to, if you could articulate what you think is that theory of change? Because to me, I think if you're starting from communities and building up local actors, at some point, all your international actors leave. But, and you've, you've said that too, you know, your development NGOs leave, your <laughs> humanitarian agencies leave. And in the end, you're left with that broken social compact between the state and, and society. So how, where is that theory of change? When do you bring the state back in? Well, the theory of change that is articulated with this, this task force is that you need to focus explicitly on, in a fragile state, why and how is that social contract broken? And so it, you, you need, that's why there needs to be a, a state component, either through greater participation by citizens in state processes uh, or more inclusive, capable institutions. And often security and justice are really at the leading edge, particularly in fragile states. Um, how to make security forces more responsive to their citizens instead of instruments of a repressive state. How to make justice more accessible, more transparent, more credible. How to address corruption which diminishes citizens' trust in a government. So I wouldn't, I mean, I think development does not ignore the state. It, if it does, then you, you're not going to get to your goal, right? Um, I mean, that was a critique of the NGO sector for many, many years, famously in Haiti in the earthquake. I think that the, the, the mainstream development community has greatly matured and got, yeah, gotten past that issue. Um, the challenge is when you just absolutely do not have a partner uh, in the government. But sometimes you have a partner at more of a local level right. or in right. one ministry versus another. I mean, you look for your entry points. I, I think there is a, a, the, one of the articles I use for the class uh, that I teach here usually to be is a, a Paul Farmer article, Pathologies of Power is the, is the collection, as you know. But it, it talks about how, how service organizations, local service entities, for-profit, not-for-profit, or, you know, faith-based or otherwise, that those connecting with the government to provide services in a different way um, can be one of those jump starters to getting more confidence at the local level. And I, I, I would yeah. just say that that's, for me, that I've always been fascinated by that and would love to see more research about it, but it's, it's a really great question. Chloe, how about our, our friends in... Yeah, so Bologna, do you Bologna, have any you... questions? You can unmute and go for it. Yeah, hi. Um, Camille, I'm a first year MA student in international development. The echo is terrible, so everyone's cringing. Um, but a uh, question in the report for the prevention of extremism in private states that has been referenced a couple times in this talk, one of the three main goals was to build partnerships with international organizations um, and other countries. Um, how do you think that our erratic military actions in Syria and the Middle East um, focus last month and over the last couple of years have impacted the ability for us to build those partnerships? And what do you think that that will do to our long-term prevention strategies? 
you know, I'm not sure that Syria is is usefully considered relevant for the focus of the report. Um, that was a particular instance of a partnership between the U.S. military and um, a fighting force, you know, a non-state actor. Uh, and I think it will have repercussions, but less so in the space of partnering internationally and with other governments on a fragility agenda or a building resilience yeah. agenda. Yeah. Uh, the question I, is, is interesting, though, because, you, and you do to your, the credit of the report, it, it does say this is, you wouldn't be doing this in every fragile state. There would have to be yeah. the conditions appropriate for it. Um, and, and it may be that that Syria, that's not the case now. Well, I mean, look, in, let's, I mean, this, the objective in Syria has always been very narrowly framed right. as defeating right. ISIS. Right. Nothing, yeah. very, you know, it's not framed in terms of helping Syria right. become less fragile right. at all. So it's kind of happening in a different arena. Right, right. great. Maybe we can take a couple, if there are more, a couple questions, maybe we can take a couple in a row, and then I, I know we have one here and one there. Where? Yes, there, one, two, are there, um, two, three? Very and then, Sorry, cool. I just, uh, I'm not saying our role in Syria was that, but, necessary, but more the fact that um, having military You know, I guess we'll see. I mean, I, I, my instinct is that it won't have an impact on the kind of partnerships that one needs to address fragility. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Watch this space. Yeah, watch this space. Hi, thank you both. My name is Susan. I'm a mid-career uh, MIPP student here, uh, and I really appreciated the focus on identifying root causes and bringing in multiple stakeholders to really try to um, reframe what we're trying to do. And I think there's, even in school here, we have specific affiliates, and a lot of times it's hard to break through those silos. So I guess my question is, how do you at the Institute of Peace and maybe advice to us who are going to be joining one type of those organizations, make sure that we're bringing in those other critical players in our problem-solving abilities so that maybe we don't default to war or to military action right away, but maybe we are able to get to a point where that's not our default. Okay, great. Can we have another question? And there was at least one or two over here. Yeah, you, you would, yeah, right in the green. Yeah. And then in front, in front of you, there's a third question as well. Hi, my name is Brett, and I'm in the mid-career program with Susan as well. And I had a quick question just sort of about counterexamples for fragility. So um, what about those states that meet all the criterion for fragility but where there's not extremism? Mm -hmm. And what the difference is there mm. um, between those states that, that somehow avoid um, the pitfalls and the horrors of extremism even though they're existing in very fragile spaces? Um, I'm thinking of Nepal, for example. Yes. My name is Bemnet Tesfaye. I'm a first year IDEV student as well, international development. Um, in regards to USAID with the transformation and the statement of the journey to self-reliance, how do you see USIP working in relation to those two things? Thank you. <coughs> Great. Questions? Um, on in, in, the, in any order? In yeah, any way. on the fragile, fragile states without extremism. Um, who asked that? Yeah, okay. I thought, I, um, I would say two things. One is um, the report very specifically says that the recipe is that these core conditions associated with fragility are present, as is extreme ideology. So, you, you know, it's not that just it will automatically pull it forward. But I would say Nepal, the Maoists were by any yeah. measure yeah. extremists. Yeah. And the, the, you know, all the, the best studies I've seen really pin it to the core grievances that were out in the West. Interestingly, Someone when, who spent some time in Nepal, right? I lived there for several years. Okay. When President Reagan uh, implemented uh, legislation here that 
force them to reduce their production of hemp, which for us was marijuana, but for the Nepalis was a core cash crop used for, right? You know, so it's like these unintended consequences of so many things that spiral out. On the breaking down of silos, um, you know, I think this is the core challenge for bureaucracies going forward. I mean, all of our structures were from a different century. There, you, you know, I think of this upcoming generation who is sort of a digital native, more schooled in how to think in networks instead of vertical silos. Uh, this is the challenge to meet. Um, and this is a core thing that I hope all the universities are picking up because we are hamstrung when you have your narrow view. We do a lot of tabletops at USIP where we take a really complicated That's problem. It's a simulation exercise? It's a simulation okay. exercise. Complicated problem like what do you do in the Lake Chad Basin? It's not just a kinetic action. You've got to put all these other factors on the table and you bring DOD, state aid, NGOs, UN together in a couple of days where they're not looking at it from the lens of their tools, but what's the problem? And then you figure out what has to happen. We tried to do that at USAID, even just internally, even within AID, getting development and relief people to think collectively outside of their institutional frames mm -hmm. is really hard. This is the challenge. And the UN is, as you said, I mean, it's, it, it, that really needs reform. We need to grab this moment of disruption because there's big disruption in all of the systems right now. It's disturbing at one level, but it's also a huge opportunity. And it's, you know, those of you coming out of the institutions now that are thinking and working on this that will really, I think, be the big movers on this going forward. On how do, how does USIP relate to the transformative journey to self-reliance agenda? You, you know, I think that's a re-articulation in, in a lovely way, and I give uh, Administrator mm -hmm. Green lots of credit, of mm -hmm. core development yeah. principles. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly USIP thinks a lot about how we are working to equip frontline actors in conflict-affected countries with the skills and tools necessary to prevent, <coughs> mitigate, and resolve the conflict that they face. You know, we operate on the premise that there will always be conflict. Like, probably someone in this room had a conflict today already. But it's do you have the skills to keep it from being uh, turned into a violent conflict, yeah. uh, 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 conflict that tears families, communities, and countries apart? Because those are the tools and skills that we seek to enable communities and countries to be self-reliant. Great answer. Um, is there a last burning question, um, either? Bologna or here? Anything else? I have a question. Oh, yes. Take, take the Okay. Line. My question is about climate change. Does USIP mm -hmm. view um, maybe people being displaced due to climate change um, as like a, a factor for extremism or like maybe one of those root causes of extremism? And do you think that some kind of climate change resilience work or food security work, um, and not just like shipments of food, but maybe agriculture for development. Can that play a role in fighting the root causes of extremism? And does USIP have any kind of opinion on that? We definitely look at the role of, um, of the impacts of climate change, particularly in fragile states that are least equipped to deal with it. How, the, how that plays into violent conflict. And it, you know, it, it, so Nigeria is a place where we've worked for many years. And, but interestingly, right now, the herder-farmer conflict, because of the an increased desertification, loss of herding land, plus demographic pressures, it, you now far outstrip Boko Haram in annual fatalities. Um, so it's actually less of a factor for violent extremism, but more a factor for violent conflict in Nigeria. But, you, you know, it, it just it underscores that you really need to look at the particulars and the complexity of a given environment. So Lake Chad Basin mm -hmm. is certainly a place where the combination of climate change with food scarcity, demographics, you know, lack of governance, you know, all of these factors. Libya, with its flood of fighters and weapons coming down into the region, all of those play a role. And so that's why you have to be thinking in a, 
we, we live in a really complex world. And if we don't have a way for our capabilities to be as sophisticated as the environment we're seeking to address, we will not be successful. We won't. Um, we are in an academic institution. Um, and at, the, at a graduation, there's often a commissioning. And I thought I heard you beginning to, uh, I don't know, to, to say to, to the audience here, there are things that you can do when you go out of here. I mean, it was in response to a question. But I would invite any other commissioning of this group here in Bologna. How can this group bring peace and support some of these initiatives about prevention, how to transform existing violent conflicts um, into something else, how to build community, community resilience to the people who would want to foment violence? Is there anything else you wanted to add? Because I, th I thought you were going there, and I wanted to Well, I thought I went there. More. I thought I went there. I, I think that you know the, the newly emerging class of professionals working on okay. these issues, okay. you know, a need to think at how all these pieces fit together and, and be less eager to claim a narrow expertise, uh, but think about the, the the intersections. You need to think in terms of systems, like how does a particular system work up to the global system. Um, so specialists, but also the enough general yes. generalists or connections between the disciplines, and maybe that's even happening in, in the academic fold. Is yeah, I mean, you need the expertise, but you know, over the last 20 years, we've kind of gone narrower and narrower bore, mm -hmm. and that's a helpful input, but not if it's driving your analysis. And my second piece would be that I think it's really important that everybody has a grounding in conflict analysis. That if you don't understand, and this is a piece of a systems perspective, if you don't understand how what you're doing will work inside that system and enable which actors in what way, and I really commend the World Development Report mm -hmm. of the World Bank mm -hmm. from 2017 mm -hmm. on the elite uh, bargains that are critical. But you have to be more political. You have to understand conflict analysis. And you have to understand the systems within which you're working. It's, we're past the day where you can just like go in and save lives by giving a bunch of food out. It's just not that simple. Great, great ending. Um, please join me in thanking Nancy Lindborg for the USIP. This is excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that concludes our roundtable. And I just want to thank Nancy Lindberg for sharing her time and experiences and insights one more time. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, and I just want to put one final plug for our last roundtable of the semester. It is next week, same time, same place. We're going to have Xavier De Victor from the World Bank's uh, Fragility, yes, Violence, and Conflict yes. Group. So, discussing the World Bank's approach to a similar issue. Um, but thank you all for your time, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks.